Hello and welcome to Creative Spaces, the podcast on a mission to reignite real world connection. I'm Molly Cooper and every episode I share the stories behind incredible people doing brilliant things in the world of travel, design and hospitality. From the founders and owners who have brought spaces to life, to chefs, writers, designers and many, many more, join me as I sit down with the teams connecting people and places across the country. I'm also incredibly excited to share that soon you will be able to connect with Britain's best slow living spaces and under the radar finds on the brand new Curated Spaces platform. From weekly giveaways to flash sales and last minute availability, we're making 2024 the year of the stake. Head to our website to get yourself on that early bird list and you can bag yourself some pretty lovely prizes in our pre-launch giveaway. Now, without further ado, let's get into today's conversation. In today's Snapshot episode, I'm delighted to welcome travel writer and photographer Catherine Soane, who is going to be telling me all about her favourite places around the Cotswolds in this secret guide to the region. Catherine, it's such a pleasure to be talking to you today. Welcome to Creative Spaces. How are you doing? Really good, thank you. It's um, so nice to be here and kind of give you all my sort of secret spots. But I can't wait because I've been lucky enough to go to the Cotswolds a fair few times over the past few weeks for the recording of the Cotswolds edition. And it's just such an amazing part of the world. But I feel like there's such a secret side to it that you don't see in the movies. And I can't wait to hear all about it from a local. I am, for one, very biased. I um, think, yeah, I mean, gosh, there's a lot of hype. There's a lot of stories. There's a lot of spotlights on this area. But it really is quite a local spot sort of area when you come down to it and there's a very lovely undercurrent that I think is quite nice to shine a light on. Definitely well I can't wait to get into it but I'd love to start with you actually and hear a bit about your background so I know you've had a very cool career to date and how you've ended up here in the Cotswolds. I mean that's thank you <laughs> it's been a long journey I suppose but um Despite the accent, I have lived in the UK forever. I was born in New York, um, have half of the family as Americans and half are English, but I, yeah, have gr- grew, grew up in London and um, lived there for a very long time, but was on a different schooling system. So spent a few years for college in New York, equally a brilliant city. I'm so spoiled rotten by amazing food, amazing hospitality, amazing hotels. And I quickly had a job offer when I finished uni to come back to the UK and work for Condé Nast Traveller, which was a dream come true. And I worked under the amazing woman and creative and writer and editor Melinda Stevens, who is just a brilliant mind and a brilliant person. And I was there sort of working on, I was working sort of for her, but I was also working on the magazine for feature writing and ideas and trend-based visual stories and all of this good stuff. And then equally doubling down and working with a brilliant online team. So journalism is kind of what I just fell into. I didn't study it. I studied hospitality. Um, I live and breathe hotels. I live and breathe food. And thankfully I get to kind of write about that every day. So, um, that is my background in very shiny, glossy magazines. And now I'm freelance, which is also a wild journey. Oh, so cool. And I think to so many people, I mean, Continental Traveller is just the absolute dream, isn't it? So how lovely for you to sort of fall into that. Just so brilliant. Yeah, it's the ultimate travel magazine for sure. Oh, well, I can't wait to get a bit of your Condé Nast Traveller insights in this secret guide to the Cotswolds then. Shall we kick things off then with um, a sort of overview to the region? So maybe if someone hasn't been or they've only ever sort of seen it in glimpse, glimpses of little honeysuckle villages on the telly. Can you sort of introduce the area and maybe what it's most famous for? Yeah, definitely. So um, the Cotswolds kind of spans quite a few counties in the West Country. So just west of London, um, quite an easy drive for Londoners to hop out. But it's Oxfordshire, Gloucestershire, Warwickshire, um, down to Bath, down to Bristol. And it's rolling green hills. And yes, honey-hued stone limestone buildings and beautiful tiny little villages sort of sprinkled with bigger cities like Cheltenham, 
Siren Sester, obviously it's got Oxford right on its doorstep. Um, so it's a real mix of very quiet, small spots, but then you've got busier hubs with lots going on. And equally, it's, I mean, it's known obviously in medieval times for its sheep trading and its wool trading, um, but it's also sort of now blown up just because of its incredible food scene, its pubs with rooms, its walks, amazing sort of trails and circular walks um, from tip to top. And it's an outstanding, it's an area of outstanding natural beauty. So it's got a lot going for itself. Yeah, it's really quite a special spot. And I know when I've been asking people like, where would you like to hear more episodes from? This, you know, some regions, Cornwall, the lakes and the Cotswolds just have such a loyal following, don't they? Pete is just such a special, special place. And I think you kind of touched on it there. It's so well located, like you can whiz out, especially if you're going to almost the Oxfordshire side and you live in West yeah. London, you can be there in like an hour. It's so, it's so, so accessible. Easy. It's so easy. I think that's, yeah, definitely what's so appealing is it's, um, it's access to London, which is really nice. But um, yeah, I mean, it is kind of the gateway to the Southwest. You can sort of spend some time there and then do the trek down to Cornwall if you want to do the trek down to Devon. Yeah, it's it's lovely. And I don't know whether it is because it's so close to London, but it just has, as you said, such a popping off food and drink scene. Every tiny little village you go to has these gorgeous pubs and restaurants and the food's yeah. amazing. They're doing brilliant things with wine and there's so many local vineyards. So maybe we should start there. And I'd love to hear about your favourite spots to eat and drink and where you like to go and let, let your hair down on a Friday night. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm completely spoiled. Uh, the, and the list is endless. I mean, um, I was just telling you about how my maps, my Cotswolds map is a bit, it's a bit crazy. It's a bit chaotic, but I, I swear I'm adding a new place that I want to visit every week at this point. But there's loads and loads and loads of really amazing pubs doing incredible, like incredibly well at the moment. But um, more recently, I think... I mean, it depends. You can, there's still really beautiful kind of local boozers, which always kind of have their place and you can't beat them. But for a bit more of a spiffed up spot, um, there's been much fanfare to the new bowl in Chalbury, which is yeah. from the Pelican team in, the, in Notting Hill. And They've just hit the they've just hit the nail on the head with it. I mean, the design is incredibly pared back inside. It's not trying to be anything but a pub with very good food and very good drinks. It's got the appeal of being in Chalbury, which you can take the train in directly. And um, they've just got a very lovely vibe. So that is one of my favorites at the moment. I can't kind of stay away, um, which is bad for the bank, but also... <laughs> Um, it's worth it every time, every single time. Oh, 100%. I was actually there a few weeks ago. We stayed there on one of our recording trips and it was just lovely. And what I really loved was the mix of people in there. Like yes. you could really tell it was some were local, some were visiting. There was like a, looked like a group of maybe women like my mum's age who looked like they'd been swimming or something and they were yeah. all having a pint afterwards. It was just a really lovely, like mix of people having lovely food in a very lovely candlelit setting. That's exactly it. Yeah, I think it's it's for everyone, and it's you just know what you're you know you're gonna have a good time, and you're gonna have good food, and you can go on your own. You can go with friends. You can sit in the garden in the summer. You can go watch the Six Nations. You can do whatever you fancy, and it's acceptable, which is great. Yeah. Um, another group who I really love, actually, there's a few groups out here, but um, the Pete and Tom pubs. So. The Lamb and Shipton under Witchwood, the Bell and Langford, um, the Fox and Broadwell, which is actually my favorite one, and the Sherborne Arms in North Leach, which I was actually just there the other night, which is so local and, you know, sort of kids piling in, saying hello to each other in the bar in the evening, and um, everyone kind of knows everyone's name and the bartender, and they just, they nail the localness and keeping it and keeping it local keeping it for the village but again incredible sourdough pizzas pies gate you know they have venison during game season and partridge and all of this stuff but it's always it's always amazing and at the lamb and shipton i mean 
there's this local with three whippets and he always comes in, you know, sort of t- towers into the room with his whippets. And you just know that that's the, that's, it's still appealing to, to the, the regulars, which is nice. Because there's nothing nicer than arriving somewhere and it being like absolutely chock-a-block with locals there catching up. You really feel like you've sort of tapped into a local community for your, for your weekend or your night that you're there. I love that. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I think this, my very, very favorite place, which The Secret is sadly now out about, um, it's down kind of about an hour from where I live, but it's in the Slad Valley, which is beautiful, beautiful, striking hills and winding roads. And it's actually quite scary to drive, especially in the winter. Um, but it's called the Woolpack and it is sensational. And it is the pub that the writer, Lori Lee, used to go and sit and drink his ale and write his wonderful books and stories. And it's just fabulous food. It's very St. John-esque and um, it's just, yeah, it's wonderful. So they win in my book for the best pub. (laughs) I love it. They get the awards. Congratulations, Wolfpack. And then pubs aside, I know that there's a real um, like farm shop and farm produce or like field to fork scene. Obviously, you've got so many incredible local producers and farmers and craftsmen. Um, Are there any top picks there that you'd like to shout out or recommend people visit while they're around? Yes. I mean, we always love kind of eating with the seasons and shopping more locally and supporting sort of the small growers and the producers, as you said. But there's obviously... Wonderful farm shops from Jolly Nice, which is down closer to Sirencester, which have the most incredible array of colors and pastas and sauces. Actually, their ice cream is sensational. And they have this marmalade buttered toast ice cream, which I didn't even know was something you could do with buttered marmalade toast, but it was delicious. Um, All local dairy, local cream, et cetera, et cetera. And then... I love the organic farm shop, which is just divine. It's a bit more earthy, a bit more homegrown. And they, I mean, you can bring your sort of glass milk jar back and refill the milk that has just been, that's just come from the cows in the fields. And it's, um, it's very lovely. And they do really amazing deli salads as well throughout the week. So there's so much there's I mean there's amp- there's all I could go on there's ampersand butter who just do really amazing whipped cultured butter that you can buy and then obviously there's the kind of creme de la creme which is Dalesford and her amazing um, Carol Bamford's amazing store and spa and her Bamford stays her sort of pubs with rooms that are just dotted around the Cotswolds and they're all from you know all the food is from her farm and she really kind of champions what's grown here in the Cotswolds and in the UK. And it's just actually the most incredible, can't deny it, it's the most incredible space. So I love all of those spots for a treat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's such an iconic brand when you think Cotswolds, you think Dalesford, don't you? She's just done such a good job building out out that portfolio of incredible spaces, but also never losing that connection to the ground and the region and the earth and sustainability and seasonality, which I love. It's just even more so that it sort of started over 20 years ago and it's still thriving, which is great. Exactly. And I think you forget as well, I mean, obviously organic and seasonal eating is, you know, everywhere now, but yeah, people like, like Dalesford, they, they really pioneered that them. And obviously yeah. you have King Charles down the road doing his bit. So it really was, yeah you know, at the forefront of this movement, which is incredible, like you say, 20 yeah, years ago. Definitely. It's great. Okay. And then, so once you've spent your, <laughs> you've eaten your way around the Cotswolds, eating yourself into a food coma of cream and butter and all the rest of it, um, I guess you better go and walk that off or maybe get some fresh air. So do you have any top picks of where people can go and maybe get off the beaten track or go, go stretch their legs or maybe just recharge through another means, whether that's curiosity, culture? What, what do you like to do? So I, yes, I am a very active person. I think I spend most of my time, most of my free time walking, getting out and about, driving around. But we're, I mean, with all of these hills, there are so many foot trails and so many circular walks that you can do. I, my boyfriend and I actually finished finally over a year and funnily enough most of the time we spent walking in the winter which was silly but actually very quite funny when you look at it we finished the Cotswold Way 
which is a 103 mile trail from Chipping Camden, which is the very tip top of the Cotswolds all the way down to Bath. I recommend everyone and anyone to do it. It's accessible. It's incredibly well marked. Um, You can do it in little sections and chunks. So whatever suits your time frame and your schedule, but it's so dreamy and it's, you know, the, it's a man-made trail. So they've planned it that you walk from village to village and you go up and you get views and then you pop down into the villages and you can kind of feast and refuel and then go again. And it was so rewarding to get to Bath. I mean, I think we both kind of crumbled and um, we're so happy that we completed something so amazing that just covers this entire escarpment that runs along the Cotswolds. So that is a very wonderful walk to do. I love that. Also, it's so nice to have a little project to chip away at and do in chunks, that sense of achievement. I know. Um, I imagine you felt like you've really earned that meal afterwards each bit. <laughs> Always. I mean, it's that's really why we walk, isn't it? To walk to the pub and <laughs> have a restorative meal. But it's, um, yeah, it's a lovely walk. And obviously then you end up in a gorgeous bath, which is very, very nice. But there's loads of sort of walks like this. There's the Darcy Dalton Way, which is 50 miles. And there's lovely sort of, yeah, circular walks up around Broadway Tower and Burford. And I mean, there's loads of public foot trails. So we're very spoiled. Very spoiled. Don't forget your wellies or your walking boots. Get out there, even in the rain. It makes the warm, cozy pint after all the sweeter, doesn't it? (laughs) Yeah, it does. And I mean, not to forget as well, there's, I mean, the separate from walking but obviously it's it goes hand in hand with kind of the beautiful views and everything going on but there's amazing neolithic sites around here and kind of there's the witchwood forest and the cornbury estate and the roll right stones which are i mean i feel like folklore is very popular these days so that's pop that's i mean everyone loves going there and seeing those stones and equally i mean the national trust has so many amazing country piles around here like Snow's Hill Manor which is a beautiful sort of arts and crafts home um, and Kiffsgate Gardens, Chasselton House, all of these sort of quirky amazing former homes of quite wealthy people around here and and um, f- uh, sort of members of society who aren't quite a bit of money in the world trade and it's passed on. All of these homes are still sort of intact and preserved and you can pop your head into all of them so it's incredible yeah oh you know what I actually love a national trust property you can't beat it can you I love it (laughs) I love it and they always have amazing cakes run by sort of local local villagers who help out and sort of have a delicious super stuffed Victoria sponge and you can't you can't beat it exactly give me a cup of tea and a scone any day and I'm happy yeah (laughs) oh well I guess there's so much going on it's quite hard to know where to start so if someone is maybe they're like me they're stuck in London most of the time and they want to plan a little trip out how would you recommend they spend 48 hours let's say what would your top picks be this is tough um because there's obviously so much going on but you a hundred percent need a car um, there are loads of sort of train stations that you can get to, but, you know, sometimes it's not well connected or there's not enough in one area. And I would not recommend taking cabs anywhere because they're so expensive. So I would get a car as soon as you can. Mm-hmm. But I mean, it would be remiss not to, obviously, it's it's called the Gateway to the Cotswolds, Burford. I love it. It's my nearest spot and it's sort of a beautiful hill with amazing rolling views in the background but it's a market town and it's got lovely little delis and shops and I recently a few weeks ago had the privilege to go see some of the snowdrops in season at Matthew Freud's house at the Priory which was the biggest snoop of all snoops because he's got two Anthony Gormleys in his garden which was incredible um so that was lovely I would say Burford for a little mosey about And then head on up to Stowe because there's such good shops and food. Again, there's Dembrosi Fine Foods who do really, really amazing deli salads and fried chicken. And they have lots of American, they're American, so they have lots of American staples. And Cutter Brooks is down in that area, which is very lovely homeware and fashion 
and interiors and domestic science. There's domestic science, which is filled with candles and ceramics. And I mean, I think you could actually spend so much time there, but the secret there, well, again, sorry, not secret because everything's sort of out, but there's a beautiful church there that actually inspired. There's sort of a big tree that has grown and morphed itself into one of the doors of the church. And it, it's the tree that inspired Tolkien to write The Hobbit, which is quite cool. Wow. Oh, I love that. I know. There's, I mean, that's the thing. It's always little nooks and crannies you have to go and find to discover all these. But so I love that side, obviously, in the North Cotswolds. And then you could do, um, you could, I guess, head on down further sort of to nail, really creative around Nailsworth and Stroud. There's a lot happening. Um, I I'm, I mean, I'm s- sort of stuck in this North area a little bit, but um, there's beautiful Astle Manor, which is where the Mitford sisters lived. And they... I mean, they're quite infamous, but they have a very lovely history. But actually, the the film remake of Nancy Mitford's Pursuit of Love was filmed at Rusham Gardens. So, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm kind of rambling on about all of these different yeah. spots. But garden hopping, I would do. I mean, it's it's endless. And But I think most people, when you think of the Cotswolds, which is quite popular, is Bybury for the Arlington Row, the kind of old weavers' homes, which are... You can't deny they're really beautiful, but you can't park and you can't walk. So to me, it's kind of about finding the alternatives to places like this. So instead of Bybury, I would go to the Slaughters, Upper and Lower Slaughter, which are really, really beautiful. Um, And sort of of, they also have a really lovely river running through and an old chunky stone bridge that crosses over. So that to me would be something that I would suggest someone to come and do is sort of the alternative um, or if you do really want to go to Bybury, go do the circular walk. Then that goes and ends up at Coons and Onwins, which has an amazing pub there called the New Inn. And you can get burgers and um, just tie in a little extra touch here and there. Mm-hmm. Cool. I love it. I feel like I just want to jump in the car immediately and get straight out of there. <laughs> yes, <laughs> get a big breath full of fresh air. Yes. <laughs> oh, well, it's been such a pleasure chatting, Catherine. Um, like I say, I'm going to be seeing the Cotswolds very soon, it feels like. And I've inspired yes. me to come and explore it even more. I do, of course, have a closing tradition of a yep. quick fire round. So okay. shall we give it a go? Let's give it a go. Okay, so the Cotswolds aside, what's one space or one place in the UK that you love to return to again and again? Um. I can't resist the seaside. So I love Kent. Um, I've yet to kind of make it down and explore some amazing spots happening, even in St. Leonard's on Sea and Hastings. I love Deal. I love Whitstable and I can't resist it. So uh, yes, Kent. Oh, lovely answer. I love the sea. So cleansing and refreshing. Good for the soul. Yes, Um, And are you more of a staycay person or an international vacay person? Gosh, it's overwhelming (laughs) because my list of spots that I want to check out is endless. Um, I think I like to do a bit of both. I mean, sometimes the comfort of your area can be just as lovely and it almost feels like an international vacation when you're exploring a destination that is on your home soil, but you've never thought to sort of venture into um but I can't resist some Mediterranean sun and sea so I do have to say that sounds quite appealing right about now Mm. especially uh, I was gonna say February but it's now March but we've cracked the back of winter Mm, we're getting there gotta book those trips in (laughs) yeah and what is one holiday ritual that you do wherever you go um well I I tend to I am so excited anytime I travel. I mean, I'm, I sort of get so stressed out before I go and get pre-departure stress. But the second I'm on the plane, I get all excited and, and giddy. But I love to take, I mean, I say this now, but as I'm getting a bit older, I regret booking the very first flight that you can get to a destination because I love arriving somewhere new and then going for lunch because it's the most exciting meal and you're in a new place or a familiar place you've been to and a long lazy wine fueled lunch is always a very nice thing so that is my 
anytime I kind of book somewhere, I'm like, let's take the first flight because then we're there for lunch and we have the whole rest of the day. Ooh, I love that. Have to get, it, get up at two or three in the morning, which I don't know <laughs> is much fun anymore. So yes, that is, <laughs> I think see, my, I always... that's my tradition. Maybe less of a ritual. I'm going to try and start doing that because I always book the last one because I'm not a morning person. But that means you get there when it's all dark, which is nice to wake up there, but you don't get your boozy lunch on the first day, which sounds very appealing. Yes, it's the way to go. Yes. And Mm. then last but not least, what destinations are top of your list for 2024? Big, very big question. Um, I am desperate to do, I've never been to India. And I'm not sure if I'm this year, but I think definitely next year, I would love, love to do a big trip to India and mix in bits of the North, bits of the South, maybe even Sri Lanka. Um, It's been on my list for ages, but I've never actually properly thought it through. And I'm seeing really lovely people there at the moment with just beautiful, beautiful imagery. And I am now hooked. So I think India... um, I think I'm far flung. I haven't done a far flung trip in quite a long time. And I'm really craving sort of all those wild emotions that you go through when you're in somewhere quite far from what you're from what you know. So there's different sort of market smells and street food and people yelling and banging, you know, pots and platters and everything. So I also really want to go to Seoul in South Korea, which I don't know the kind of bright lights, big building energy and kimchi everywhere and fashion and skincare. And I mean, it just seems like it takes every box that I'm looking for. So those are far flung. And then I suppose closer to home, um, this is tough, where closer to home. I spent some time... um, I mean, honestly, I think I, you know, there's hotels in the UK that I've, I've never been to Glebe House in Devon. Like I really want to go down there and spend a long weekend in Devon and um, just sort of explore that side and yeah, kind of just stay close to home, I suppose. You know what? You have to go to Glebe. It's just lovely. Also, I think it would be nice either to get you ready mentally for India or to decompress when you come back, but you should definitely get yourself down there. <laughs> Oh, it's been such a pleasure chatting, Catherine. Thank you so much. And I'm feeling pretty inspired to come and check out the Cotswolds again. Yes, please do. I mean, um, anytime. Just let me know. <laughs> it's been a pleasure. thank you for sharing your top spots and bringing this amazing part of the world to life for me and for the listeners i can't wait to start booking that next trip and thank you of course to all you lovely listeners who tune in week after week thank you for your kind words reviews and ratings it really means the world and keeps the podcast going I'm also incredibly excited to announce that the Curated Spaces podcast is soon to become the Curated Spaces platform, where we'll be connecting curious travellers with the best slow living spaces and under the radar finds around the country. If this sounds like your kind of thing, then please do head to our website to get yourself on that early bird list and keep your ears peeled as we start to officially count down to launch in the next few weeks. In the meantime, I will, of course, see you next time for more Curated Spaces.